Hi, I'm Chuck Caro, and we're here at beautiful San Antonio Zoo. You know, for over 100 years, our zoo has been dedicated to securing a future for wildlife. Now, through its passion and expertise in animal care, conservation, and education, the zoo's mission is to inspire the community to take a leap for wildlife. That is, to love, engage with, act for, and protect animals and the places they live. Now, how do we do that? Well, Today, we're going to take a look at some fantastic stories of animals and the people who help further our mission. So, if you're ready, let's do this. Let's take a rare look at San Antonio Zoo. It's the dream of many children to become a zookeeper. You love animals, you get your education, and wham, you get a job at a zoo. Now that's exactly what Emily Middleman did. Now she has a very special bond with Kutu, a 5,000 pound, 20 year old rhinoceros, an animal on the endangered species list. Unfortunately, um, all the rhino species are endangered, but um, the white rhinos like Kutu here and the black rhinos especially tend to get a lot of popularity because their numbers have been dwindling so much out in the wild. Their number one danger that they face out in the wild is actually poaching from humans. It's not any conflict from another animal, it's humans that are their greatest enemies. The majority of that reason is because of poaching unfortunately for this beautiful horn. You can see Kutu here has two horns and a lot of the times the poachers will kill the animals in the wild simply just to chop off the horn. They don't need any other part of the body so these animals are shot dead and they chop the horn off and um, the main uh, two reasons that they take the horn is number one um, it's used in a lot of older medicine they'll actually grind that horn up put it into a tablet form and they think it's a cure-all unfortunately there's no scientific backing to prove um, that this horn actually does do anything medically to help you um, it's simply made of keratin so keratin is a protein that makes up our hair, skin, and nails. It's a very common term. Um, basically, it's an overgrown nail on his head. Um, so like I said, there's no medical um, use for it, uh, but there's still that stigma in, in old style medicine that this horn could be used for something. Um, the other reason that they get poached for their horn is that it's a status symbol um, for illegal hunters. So uh, a rhino horn, it's, if it's intact on the black market, can go upwards of $100,000. US, so um, they pay, people who are behind this have a lot of money, um, and unfortunately we're fighting you know, the fight for a big power with a lot of money behind it, so um, that's why it is such a fight, but it's definitely a fight worth it for these animals to keep their horns. At Care for Wild, I had the opportunity to work actually with the South African parks and work a lot with the rhino dehorning. So most of the rhinos that you will see that are at least kept on rescues or sanctuaries are actually dehorned. And they do that for a very important reason out in Africa, because if you dehorn a rhino, it takes away the opportunity for the poachers to want to poach them. If there's nothing to take off, then there's no reason to poach them. So it doesn't hurt the animal. Now we don't do that to our animals here in America just because we don't have that threat of poachers. So uh, Kutu here gets to take care of his own horn. You can see he does a great job of managing it. So very similar to how we take care of our fingernails, he actually follows it down. So he's got several spots in the exhibit that he loves to follow his horn down on. We'll see uh, in the morning we'll have big piles of rhino shavings. So very much if you file your own nails at home and you'll see the, just the little scrapings that come off from that, same thing just on a larger scale. So it's really fun, but uh, he, he takes great care of his both of his horns. They look great. It's like the perfect example of a rhino. <laughs> In the blockbuster film Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum famously said, nature finds a way. Now this was in reference to the seemingly impossible task of dinosaurs reproducing without males. Seems far-fetched, or is it? San Antonio Zoo proves that what once was thought of as science fiction is indeed science fact, thanks to a little white-spotted bamboo shark named Colette. She's a very special birth due to the way that she was hatched here. We have two female white spotted bamboo sharks that are adults. They lay eggs continuously as part of their normal cycle, whether or not they're fertilized. I leave them in there for a period of time, but eventually they need to be pulled from the tank 
So as I'm pulling them out, I just hold them up to the light and you can see the yolk through the leathery pouch. And as I held it up to the light, I saw something wiggling around inside of there. And it wasn't a huge surprise that it could happen, but it was a surprise that I actually found one. And in some instances, you can have one that's sort of spontaneously viable without fertilization from a male. And that is referred to as parthenogenesis. So she is a result of that. So she has no father, just one mother. Her name is Colette, and I picked that name because in French it means victorious, so I thought it was fitting for her since this is such a rare thing. She's a very victorious individual for being able to survive and, and make it to this point. Due to the lack of information, we have a particular advantage here where we can follow her throughout her life cycle and keep good records of everything and maybe add some new information to what's currently known, maybe find out a little bit more about reproduction later on in life and just overall how their health is throughout their lifestyle. And if it differs from, you know, a, a sexually reproduced individual. Now, on to a great success story, one that includes amazing animal care, dedication, and commitment. Whooping cranes, they're a native Texas bird that was once on the brink of extinction with only 16 birds left at one time. Their fate was bleak, but thanks to some creative conservation efforts and a species survival plan, the five foot tall bird is making a comeback. These are American whooping cranes, two species found in North America and we've had these birds here for over 24 years. They are currently endangered because of habitat loss and through hunting. So we're working with Fish and Wildlife and other institutions to propagate and breed these species and release them back into the wild. In 1941, there were only 16 birds alive and now currently there's over 500 birds in the population now. So they are being bred and they are being raised and there are efforts to release them into the wild. They're very difficult to breed and we're, the, everyone is working together in unison trying to find out the secrets on how to get these birds to actually to breed and consistently breed year after year. Since the early 1980s, the San Antonio Zoo successfully raised about 15 whooping crane chicks. Well, we use this puppet for hand rearing of all our chicks. When they hatch out, they never see human beings and they're isolated from everybody. Nobody's allowed to be around this area unless they have a cloak on, meaning they have a sheet and a hood on. Uh, we want the babies to stay in a wild state and we don't want them to be familiar with human beings. So the day that we do release them, they don't seek out humans. And literally, I would walk around with this and picking up items of food, crickets, pellets, you know, showing them where the water is, because these are babies. They have no idea where their food is, and they don't know what food is. We have to show them. So we walk around, and we make little noises, and all they can actually see is pure white, because the parents are pure white, and they have the red, so the red is a stimulant. And so we just offer the babies food. So all day, he's walking around. Kind of a neat job, pretty easy, but you have to suffer in the heat. And but it's it's wonderful. It's it's a great experience to be a part of rearing a baby from day one. And it takes about three months for the baby to grow up. Moving cranes can live up to 24 years in the wild in captivity longer because of the great health care, the way the birds are maintained and housed. So they do live longer lives. These birds will disappear if we're not careful, and so that's why. Everyone is involved in this breeding program, and it's, it was important that we try to save as many species on this on the planet before they disappear. Extinct is forever, so we don't want that. So at one point they were almost they were almost extinct. It wasn't for those 16 birds and all the efforts of all the institutions working together, Fish and Wildlife, zoos, and other places, Audubon zoos. These birds would be gone. By now, you've probably gotten the idea that some animals can't make it without our help. At San Antonio Zoo, there are so many conservation efforts, including that of the Puerto Rican crested toad. Now, they're the only naturally occurring toad on the island of Puerto Rico, but habitat loss, drought, and invasive species have reduced their numbers. Where do you see the long distance efforts between San Antonio and Puerto Rico to replenish these tiny toads? These are our Puerto Rican crested toads, and we actually get to release them back out into the wild once we have babies. So this species of toad is an endemic toad to Puerto Rico. That's so the only place that they're found. And they're actually a nocturnal toad, and they'll live in rock crevices 
and in holes that they can find, so any holes that spiders leave behind or any other type of little animal, um, they'll inhabit those holes. They are endangered. The reasons why is because of habitat destruction. Usually people take away their ponds because they don't want a lot of mosquitoes or they're building land for more urban areas. They also have many predators. The one predator that is actually an introduced species to Puerto Rico is the marine toad. And they're a lot larger than these Puerto Rican crested toads. So when they're babies, they are susceptible to being eaten. So there's also lots of snakes and different lizards that will also eat them, and birds. When we send them back to Puerto Rico, they actually built six different ponds for them. So they have these new ponds that they will actually be released into, and then they can get accustomed to those ponds and they will actually grow up there and then leave. We have sent out about 11,000. The breeding process is about six weeks long and we do it every year. Last year we had a clutch that was over 200 tadpoles. San Antonio is known for a lot of great things. The Alamo, the Riverwalk, great Mexican food, but we're also a monarch champion city. Did you know that San Antonio is right along the migration route of the monarch butterfly? San Antonio Zoo, along with our great city, leads the way in helping these beautiful butterflies that may not be as safe as you think. Our butterfly house is one of our tropical areas that we um, demonstrate rainforest conservation. We have butterflies from all around the world, so South America, Central America, Southeast Asia, Africa and Australia, and some native ones today. We show people how you can demonstrate conservation at home and also try to give people a look at something they wouldn't see outside the world. So not every person is going to get to go to Africa or Australia, so we want to make sure that they get to see and um, witness those beautiful butterflies here. We buy chrysalis from rainforest forest areas from around the world provide income to local people so that way they can save the rainforest areas where they're at and not have to cut it for timber or palm oil or any other unsustainable crop source. Um, they also use pesticides and herbicides which are also damaging to the ecosystem. Um, obviously butterflies since they are a bug and usually pesticides harm bugs. That's a problem for butterflies but all animals have um, a sensitivity to any types of poison. We have about 200 flying individual butterflies at any given time um, and we have about 600 species that we import in throughout the year so it's a different experience every single time you come. On average a butterfly lives about one to two weeks as a butterfly through its whole life cycle, it very much depends upon the species. So it can be as long as up to eight months, as short as just a few months. Butterflies are prevalent all around the world, which is amazing. So pretty much anywhere where you've got sun and flowers, you're gonna find a butterfly. One of the things that you know we're talking about too is helping butterflies through citizen science efforts. I'm also in charge of our volunteer department. We have 600 volunteers and one of our favorite activities that we do is try to engage people in citizen science activities to where they can get hands-on conservation experience and help the efforts for scientists that you can't have a thousand scientists all over the world. Butterflies are all over the world. In particularly, in a, um, um, a species that's becoming very rare in our area, which is the monarch butterfly, that um, we are helping to save and protect here uh, by doing citizen science efforts, by looking for larvae, taking pictures and submitting them to websites um, where biologists rate and catalog them, um, and also um, getting kids and especially teenagers um, involved in those efforts so our future will be secure for those wildlife animals. One of the things that they're asking folks to do is to plant native milkweed. Just recently they discovered that we're going to need over one 1.6 million stems of milkweed in the United States alone to be able to sustain the monarch butterfly population. So by planting native milkweed throughout your area, it's a wonderful thing that people can do. And then also pollinating plants. So, you know, anything that produces a flower that is raised in an organic way, butterflies love. So attracting them to your yard. One thing you can also do is put out your organic fruit and uh, wet it a little bit and butterflies love to uh, drink out of those. At least 100 species go extinct every day. It's a race against time. But what can we do? Plenty. You can support products that are environmentally sustainable. Plant milkweed for those beautiful monarchs. Tell your friends about the realities of poaching. Educate yourself about nature. Remember, we can make a difference. All we have to do is leap, love, engage, act, and protect. Together, we can secure a future for wildlife.